Hi, Kinesiology 3030. Welcome to our review lecture for myology, our study of muscles. Um, so this is going to be an abbreviated lecture of what we did in our Zoom class. Okay. So remember our muscles take the chemical energy from our food that we metabolize to create mechanical energy or create movement for our body. Okay. That mechanical energy is transmitted into the tendons, transmitted into the bones to create um, all of our general movement, but it all comes down from the chemical energy that we consume in our food. Okay, we have three different classes of muscles. Okay, we have skeletal, we have smooth, and we have cardiac muscle. So skeletal muscle is striated muscle. It's what we're going to be talking about in this class. Smooth muscle is around our organs. Um, within our arteries, some of our vessels. Um, these get a kind of a ringing action to pump fluids throughout our body. And then cardiac muscle um, contracts onto itself and creates this ringing action to send blood out of the heart and to the rest of the body. Okay. When we're talking about skeletal, skeletal muscles, skeletal muscles are make, made up of bundles of muscle fibers, which are made up of bundles of myofibrils made up of sarcomeres, made up of these small molecules or protein molecules that cause the contractions. Okay, so these are put together in sarcomeres. Sarcomere is indicated from Z-line to Z-line. You're going to see in the next image. From Z-line to Z-line is one sarcomere. One sarcomere has actin and myosin within it. Okay, this is where that muscle contraction takes place. Sarcomeres are arranged in series or um, kind of Z discs or Z lines are backed up into each other to create a long strand of continuous sarcomeres to create myofibrils. Myofibrils are bundled together to create muscle fibers. Okay, so we're just going from really small, the actin and myosin level, to the sarcomere, to the myofibril, to the muscle fiber to the fascicle, to the entire muscle. Okay, when we're looking at an individual sarcomere, this is our Z-line to Z-line. Okay, so we have these thick filaments, which are made up of myosin, and the thin filaments, which are made up of actin. Actin is attached to the Z-line. Myosin is attached to the middle of that sarcomere. So we have a fixed point here in the middle where myosin is. This H zone is the distance that actin can travel across myosin. Um, our I band is where we only see fil thin filaments and our A band is where we see thick filaments. A the H zone is where there's only myosin filaments. But this creates a full sarcomere. <clears throat> and the goal of the sarcomere is to contract or bring Z line and Z line closer together. Okay, this happens within the muscle fiber all the way down at the sarcomere level. In the sarcomere, which are arranged together to create myofibrils, which are arranged together in bundles to create muscle fibers, which are connected to create fascicles, which are connected to create an entire muscle. Okay, muscle fibers are connected together um, from within with, with our connective tissue. It also is connected through tendons to get to bones and then fascia, which are kind of flat tendons um, that move throughout the body that connect muscles to muscles and bones to bones and kind of create a whole system throughout our body. We're not gonna go into fascia for this class, um, but just know it is some holistic connective tissue that more research is being done on. Okay, so let's break it down a little bit further. Okay, so we have our myofibril, which is our bundle of actin and myosin. Okay, so here we have actin, here we have myosin and kind of a, um, a zoomed in 3D view. The muscle cell is a muscle fiber. So muscle cells and muscle fibers are the same. So one muscle fiber is one muscle cell, okay, which is a bundle of myofibrils, which is a bundle of contractile proteins. Okay, the fascicle is a bundle of muscle cells or a bundle of tendons. Okay, but for this class, we're, we're gonna really focus on the bundle of muscle cells which is a bundle of muscle fibers, which is a bundle of muscle fibril, myofibrils, which is a bundle of actin and myosin. 
Okay, all of these put together creates the muscle belly, which is the bundle of fascicles. Okay, so we're, our muscle starts off at these really small points and expands to create this large structure that can contract and relax. Okay, so if we look at it from a, a general visual point of view, we have our individual actinomyosin filaments, which are bundled together within the myofibrils, which has all of our, all of our sarcomeres aligned together. You can see those striations right here. Okay, those are bundled together to make a muscle fiber. Okay, the muscle fiber is bundled together to make myofibrils. Okay, so we have filaments, myofibrils, muscle fibers, fascicles, okay, which are groupings of muscle fibers. Okay, so right here we can see our whole fascicle, which is our bundle of muscle fibers, into our muscle belly itself. Okay. The epimysium covers the entire muscle belly. The paramysium covers the muscle, uh, the fascicle. Um, and then the endomysium is around the muscle fibers. Okay. Um, so it goes, endomysium is a little bit smaller, it goes a little bit further down to cover all of those, or connect all of those muscle fibers together. Um, so let's move on from here. We can look at it a different way. We can look at it kind of a little bit more um, full general. Okay, we have a muscle fiber, we have a fascicle, we have a bunch of fascicles to create a muscle. Okay. We have epimysium around the outside, paramysium around the fascicle, um, and then endomysium around the muscle fibers. Okay, another view, a little um, kind of a split view. This is where we can start to see some of the striations. Uh, this is why it's called striated muscle. Those striations come from the visibility of the A bands, the I bands, from looking at these, these um, thick and thin filaments and how they are arranged next to each other. Okay. We also have other um, pieces of this muscle cell. Um, muscles are multinucleated, so they have multiple nuclei. Um, they have mitochondria, okay, so that we can have some <clears throat> energy production from aerobic metabolism. Okay, we have our sarcoplasmic reticulum, um, our transverse tubules, which we'll go into when it comes to um, the chemical reactions that occur, the changes in polarity to trigger that muscle contraction. Okay, so here's our general diagram. Okay, make sure that you remember that we have connective tissue that attaches each piece. Make sure we know that it goes from filaments is the smallest piece to sarcomere, to myofibril, muscle fiber, fascicle, muscle belly. And that's our order. Um, and then remember our order for the connective tissue Epimysium is around the outside, paramysium is around the fascicle, endomysium around the muscle fibers. Okay, so let's get into what's happening within that sarcomere when we contract. Okay, so our sarcomeres are from Z line to Z line. They're called Z lines because they look like they have kind of the Z structure as each sarcomere is attached to each other. And then how the um, actin is attached onto the Z line gives it that slight angle, kind of those. Um, angled pieces to create the Z lines. Okay, here we have actin and myosin. Actin is a thin filament that is attached to the Z line. Actin has two um, components, troponin and tropomyosin, that we're going to focus on for this class. Troponin and tropomyosin. Myosin, or the thick filament, has the myosin head okay, and the cross bridge location. Okay, this is kind of our key, the cross bridge location. Um, so myosin and that myosin head will attach to actin at the cross bridge location um, and then create a power stroke. A power stroke is where the myosin causes a pulling action when ATP is present to try to shorten that muscle or try to shrink that sarcomere. So pull actin along myosin. Okay. That myosin head can only attach to tropomyosin. Tropomyosin is only available when the muscle is um, stimulated to contract. Otherwise, troponin is blocking those tropomyosin binding sites for myosin. Okay, so let's look at it in kind of a cross-section view. 
Um, so we have our sarcomere here. Each of these would indicate a myosin head, which is which would allow a cross bridge location or a place where we can cross myosin onto actin to pull. Okay, going down a little further, okay, we have troponin, which blocks tropomyosin once um, we stimulate muscle contraction. Okay, so we send a, an impulse to contract the, this motor unit, these muscle fibers. Okay, there's a change in the, um, in the polarity within the muscle. Um, so it's a kind of an electrical stimulus if we think about it in general terms. Um, and then that allows myosin to attach onto the actin binding site um, right here, okay, which is on tropomyosin. So now we're kind of attached, but this doesn't mean that we're going to contract. We have to have ATP in order to create that muscle contraction. So ATP is our energy source. Once ATP is broken down into ADP and a free phosphate, we will perform one power stroke. Your myosin will pull, crank, actin along myosin. We also require another ATP to remove that cross bridge or to take myosin off of actin because once it's shortened it can't shorten any more from that myosin power stroke so we have to unattach so that we can reposition myosin so that it can contract again and pull actin further along myosin pull those z lines closer and closer together okay so we think about it as kind of like this this rolling cycle and we have a nerve impulse okay, which sends information sends a change um, so this if we go into generals we have acetylcholine goes into the synaptic cleft which triggers okay, um, sodium to initiate the action potential okay, so we change the polarity and this goes down the t-tubules so that we have um, a stimulation throughout those T-tubules to indicate throughout that muscle fiber that we need to contract. Um, that action potential in the T-tubules changes the voltage, um, which triggers calcium to be released. Once calcium ions are released, they attach to troponin. Um, troponin changes shape and removes that block. So tropomyosin is available. Then we can contract myosin because myosin will attach and cross bridge and power stroke. Um, and then we need ATP again to remove that cross bridge so that we can continue to cross bridge and cycle. Um, but once that signal has stopped, our polarity changes back and the muscle relaxes. Okay, so here's, here's a visual of how our myosin head would interact with actin. So here's myosin. Myosin head, actin, Z line. So we attach ATP triggers power stroke. So we get a pull, we get some movement. ATP triggers a removal or a disengaging of myosin. And then we reattach because we're still contracting ATP and triggers a movement. Okay, now that muscle continues to pull. We look at maybe another sarcomere which attaches and pulls and this is happening throughout the myofibril and throughout the muscle fiber and throughout the motor unit that is being stimulated here or the groupings of muscle fibers that are activated by that motor or motor neuron um, that was sending in that signal okay so looking at muscles muscles are excitable which means they can be stimulated or activated um, through those electrical impulses from our nervous system or electrical impulses outside. Um, they have the ability to create tension or to pull because they shorten. They can always shorten um, or they can always attempt to shorten. Okay, so the muscle always tries to attempt to shorten or it wants to pull, okay? Um, so that's our tension. We can't push with a muscle. We can only pull. The muscles can also be stretched, especially the connective tissue. The muscles can be elongated, and then it can return back to its original length. Okay, so when, when we stretch within reasonable limits, those 
that muscle will come back to the, the length that it was before its original length. Okay. Muscle fibers are also oriented in different ways. So fusiform muscles are longitudinal muscles, um, parallel muscles. These are all names for muscles that move fibers in a line from tendon to tendon. So these are things, these as linear muscles. Um, all of those sarcomeres are kind of in series. All of those fibers are in series, um, lined up together from tendon to tendon. Peniform or penate muscles have a diagonal orientation. So those muscle fibers are at an angle to the tendon. They can be unipennate, which is one-sided, bipennate, which is two-sided, or multipennate, where we have multiple angles coming in from multiple directions onto that tendon. Okay, so parallel muscles, all of those fibers are in line. Unipennate, they're coming from one side. Bipennate, they come from multiple sides. Uh, so they each have their own advantage okay, um, when it comes to creating force. So linear muscles or fusiform muscles, um, because they shorten in series, if all of these muscle fibers shorten the same distance, that tendon would move a greater range of motion or greater distance compared to if all of these shortened the same distance, that tendon wouldn't move as far. Um, but with a Penate muscle, we're able to fit more muscle fibers into the same cross-sectional area or the same circumference or same amount of muscle. We can fit more fibers, which if we have more fibers, we can create more tension or more force onto that tendon. Okay, so the angle of penation is the angle at which those fibers are oriented. Um, so they, they have their own benefits for strength and for range of motion. So if we have a parallel muscle, we have a greater excursion. If they all shortened in half, this would move um, halfway down that muscle. Compared to if all of these shortened half, it would only move maybe a third of the way down the muscle based on the, the angle. Um, but the strength comes from the sarcomeres um, that are running in parallel to each other. So we have, if we have all of these sarcomeres running in a parallel shortening, we're going to be able to shorten a greater thickness compared to the parallel muscle or we can create more tension because we have a greater cross-sectional area um, for the penate muscle. Okay, so because we have this kind of angle of orientation, we can get more muscle fibers into the same amount of total muscle volume or we can have an even larger muscle volume available to us because we can continue to fit more fibers in there. Um, so the, the ways and the shapes of these muscles um, will be based on their function. So muscles that require um, greater amounts of force will be pennate or multipennate. Muscles that require higher shortening velocities will be more fusiform. Um, some muscles may be convergent because we have to have fibers that um, run from one angle compared to fibers that run from another angle to move that tendon closer to the uh, the origin point or to the attachment point. So if we look at those range of motion in series, so we're looking back at fusiform muscles or pennate muscles. Um, if we're able to shorten that muscle 50% in a short muscle, it's going to cause less range of motion or less total motion compared to a longer muscle. So this all comes down to how many sarcomeres are in series and how many muscle fibers are in series or lined up um, back to back to back to back. So they're in a straight line linearly. Um, so these can shorten a greater distance within that period of time, which can make them higher velocity muscles um, that can create greater ranges of motion. Okay. So if those two contract in the same period of time, the long muscle is going to cause a greater distance of travel within that same period of time or a greater velocity um, for that limb that it's trying to move. Okay. Now when we name our muscles, they, they may be named by how many parts or the location of the muscles. Um, sometimes the shape, and it's a quadratus, so it's probably a square shape. Um, deltoid, it's a triangle shape or the size if it's a longus or a brevis. Longus is a longer muscle 
uh, maximus to minimus or minimus to medius, comparing size, shape, location. Um, and then maybe sometimes we'll have ones where the movement indicates the name. So like flexor halicus longus is a long muscle that flexes the halicus or the great toe, the big toe. Or extensor digiti minimi, which extends the small digit or the fifth digit. Okay. Um, so that's how we name our muscles. That's how we go through that process. Okay, now we're going to talk about contractions. Um, what happens when we contract or try to contract a muscle? Okay, an isometric muscle contraction, or isometric muscle action, is where sarcomeres attempt to shorten or they're, they're trying to create tension, but there's no movement at the joint. So the joint doesn't move or the bones don't move, even though we create tension. Think of this as balanced forces in and out and zero movement, okay, where you're holding a position. So think about if you're trying to do a pull-up and you jumped up to the top and you held on and you tried to hold on, you're still creating tension with those muscles, but you're not moving. Okay, with a concentric muscle action, this is a dynamic muscle action or isotonic or dynamic muscle action. The first one is the concentric, which is where the sarcomeres shorten when we create tension. So they actually shorten, or they create enough force to overcome any outside force. We think of concentric actions as positive actions. So the motion of the joint is in the same direction as the motion we're trying to create with our tension. Eccentric muscle actions are when our sarcomeres attempt to shorten, but are lengthened because the outside force is overcoming the tension that we're creating. So this is this is negative movement. Isokinetic muscle um, muscle contractions are where we maintain speed. These have to be machine assisted um, or manual assist. If we want it perfect, we use a machine. Um, but these allow us, especially if we're measuring this, we can measure force at different joint angles and different contraction velocities. So you'll see this more in a rehab or a rehabilitation or a research setting. Muscles also play different roles. They can be the prime mover or the agonist. This is a muscle that is causing the tension for the action. Um, the antagonist is the opposite muscle. So if the agonist is a flexor, the antagonist is an extensor. The synergist will help the prime mover. Okay, so it will assist in that motion, but it will be a smaller muscle. So the prime mover is the largest muscle that performs that movement. The synergist is a smaller helper muscle. A stabilizer will limit movements in other planes where we're not attempting to move. And then a neutralizer will stop the action from an, another muscle or another movement that a muscle might be causing based on its line of pull. Okay, so here's an example. We have our agonist and our antagonist for smooth and fast and forceful muscle contractions. When the agonist contracts, the antagonist must relax. So this limits the amount of tension that the agonist has to fight against. If the antagonist contracts while the agonist contracts, it's going to restrict movement. But the antagonist can be a useful um, when it slightly contracts throughout the movement to control speed, control velocity, control force. So coordination really comes with the synchronous and asynchronous contractions between the agonist and antagonist muscles. Okay, now let's talk about the anatomy of those muscles. Okay, those muscles all have an origin and insertion point. So the origin is the least movable point, the insertion is the most movable point. Okay, um, and then they will always cause an action while where insertion moves towards origin. So when insertion is moved towards the origin, it will create an axis. Okay, this can be in one or more planes, depending on the line of pull or the direction at which I moves towards O or insertion moves towards origin. We use this to create all of our sports or skills or activities. Everything comes from contracting muscles and moving insertion towards origin. Okay, so the line of pull is the direction at which the muscle can pull because muscles can only pull, they cannot push. And it's determined by how that muscle crosses the joint. Um, 
and we can know our origins and insertions and see how those two are going to move towards each other. Okay, uh, a hint here with how we cross the joint. Anterior muscles cause anterior movements. Posterior muscles cause posterior movements. Lateral muscles cause lateral movements. Medial muscles cause medial movements. And diagonal muscles cause rotation. Anterior diagonal muscles will cause internal rotation at our limbs um, or inward rotation. Diagonal posterior muscles will cause a outward rotation motion. Okay, um, so what we have to know is what joint movements are allowed at the joints that that muscle crosses, where the muscle connects, and then where's our, our fixed point or our origin point that's not going to move. The insertion is what is going to move. Okay. That more movable point is always going to move towards that more stable point. Okay. And then which side of the joint will tell us where that movement is going to move. Okay. So how do we create more strength? Strength comes from the ability for that muscle to create tension or force. Um, that force will come from recruiting motor units or remember we talked about motor units as the muscle fibers <clears throat> or all of the muscle fibers that one motor unit or motor neuron innervates. So if we think about it generally, it's a motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it innervates are all the muscle fibers that it stimulates. So when it can, when it sends a signal, it will contract all of those muscle fibers. So the more motor units we recruit, <clears throat> the more force we can produce for that movement. Okay. We also type or contract type one muscle fibers first because they have the lower threshold for activation um, and they're more fatigue resistant. So it will be more energy efficient for us to recruit those muscles and not use type two muscle fibers if we don't have to. Okay. And then we <clears throat> need to create just enough force to complete a task. Okay. So we rarely in life ever have to recruit the most possible force possible. Okay, so there's very few times where you have to maximally produce force, but there are plenty of times throughout the day that you have to produce just enough force. Okay, so it's not the most force that really matters in most activities. It is the perfect amount. Okay, what's optimum amount of force to complete the task. And we learn how to recruit that force. We learn how to recruit those motor units in a specific pattern, um, in specific quantities, different timing, to create tasks, create movements. Um, those who are better at recruiting their motor units and the patterns required to create the optimum amount of force to achieve a task are normally better at that task or more coordinated with that task. Okay. Muscles also have um, changes in tension availability based on their length. Um, so remember we talked about those sarcomeres and how they are getting shorter and longer. Um, so when a muscle is at its longest length, so think about all of those sarcomeres, those Z lines are as far away from each other as possible. That means that there are the fewest available cross bridge sites for myosin and actin because they're pulled so far away from each other. There's very little availability for cross bridges. When there's less availability for cross bridges, we know that's where tension is created. So if we don't have available cross bridges, we don't have the opportunity to create tension. So this is where we have the least amount of force capabilities. Okay. When muscles are at their shortest length, there's no more room for continued shortening. So if all of those Z lines are as close together as they possibly can be, we can't create more motion because we can't bring them any closer together. So we aren't able to create tension in that position because there's no more room to create a shortening distance. Um, so when a muscle is at its longest length or shortest length, we lose the availability for tension. When we are at its midpoint, okay, normally this is about resting length of a muscle, we have the maximum amount of cross, cross bridge locations. So everywhere that myosin can attach, it can. So we have the most availability which is where we can create the most tension. So muscles are strongest at resting length. Okay. Muscles can also cross multiple joints. They can have 
we can have biarticular, multiarticular muscles that don't just cross one joint, they cross multiple joints. The more joints that that muscle crosses, the more movements it can create at other joints or at each of those joints. Um, but sometimes one joint will shorten the muscle compared to the other. Um, so we lose some of the maximum force that we can produce at one joint because the other joint is also free to move um, or may not be fixed. Okay, this leads to things like active insufficiency. Okay, when one joint um, has already shortened the muscle, okay, so we've shortened the muscle from one movement, okay, we can't shorten it any further, so it affects the next joint. Okay, so we're, we're losing our ability for strength at one joint because we have shrunk that muscle or, or shortened that muscle at an opposing joint. So, so let's say we have, say our bicep muscle where we have it crossing our shoulder joint and our elbow joint. If I completely flex my elbow, I limit the availability for my bicep to contribute to shoulder flexion okay, because now it is maximally shortened. Same as if I put my arm in full flexion, it's very difficult to contract my bicep for elbow flexion when I'm in full shoulder flexion because now I've shortened the bicep and it makes it more difficult for it to contract uh, because you can't shorten that muscle as far. And we also have passive insufficiency, which is where we um, lose range of motion based on antagonistic activity. So um, say our hamstring muscles are preventing us from going into full knee extension when we're in a seated position, especially if we're in a really hip flex position. So you sit up nice and straight, lean forward, and then try to extend your knee. You have stretched your hamstring or pulled your hamstring because it is a hip extensor. You've shortened it on one side. And then as you try to lengthen it through knee extension, you limit your range of motion or availability because that muscle can't continue to stretch. So it can't be elongated further. So you lose strength from your knee extensors because your knee flexors are limiting that movement in passive insufficiency. Tenodesis is a, a, when we use uh, this concept for a positive. Um, so say if you have paralysis or loss of function, okay, we can use wrist hyperextension to create into interphalangeal or finger flexion um, to get some extra or possibility for some grip or to hold on to objects. If you maybe have a loss of your flexors, if you extend your wrist, you're going to get some flexion from the, the stretching and the pulling of those tendons, the flexor tendons, which could give you the availability to possibly hold an object if you normally couldn't. All right, now let's talk about open kinetic chain and closed kinetic chain. Open kinetic chain is when we have a free limb and we are applying our force to that limb or the object that the limb is holding and the limb is free to move. Okay, so this is where we are interacting in free space. Think about it, limb in free space. Uh, so things like bicep curl, overhead press, something like that. Okay, um, with a closed kinetic chain, we're applying force into the ground or a fixed object and our body moves. Uh, so everything moves within us in a closed chain activity. Okay, so we're pushing our force into a fixed object, open chain, we're putting our force into a freely movable object. Okay, with proprioception, this is our senses, our awareness of our limbs and our body position. Um, we have mechanoreceptors within our muscles. Uh, we also have uh, receptors within our joints. Um, the ones that we'll focus on for this class are muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs. Muscle spindles can or sense stretch and rate of stretch within a muscle and will trigger reflexive muscle contraction when stretch or rate of stretch is too great. GTOs will sense tension within the tendon and will cause reflexive relaxation of the muscle when tension is too high. Both of these are safety measures um, reflexive safety measures to stop our muscle from um, becoming injured. Okay, when it comes to fiber types, we have type one and type two muscle fibers. We're not gonna get into the intermediates in between, um, but type one is our slow twitch. These are more of our low fatigue, high endurance, smaller muscles that are always recruited first. Okay, these are our first recruited muscles because they're the most energy efficient. 
but they're also smaller and they don't have the same um, strength or speed capacity that we see with type 2 fibers, which are made for high strength, high power activities, but they are highly fatigable. Um, so they're larger, they're stronger, they're faster, but they're recruited second because they take a higher threshold to activate and they fatigue very quickly. Okay, so how are they distributed type one to type two? Uh, type one muscle fibers are predominantly in the midsection of the trunk, um, the soleus. Um, these are endurance muscles. So anything that helps you with posture or um, something where you have to have endurance within that muscle, um, you probably have more type one. Compared to type two, think of these as more explosive muscles where we're trying to um, create high velocity contractions rather than continued repeated contractions. Okay, but most people are about 50-50 throughout the entire body. Okay, so who has more? If you train for one stretch or one, uh, you'll probably build a little bit more of those fibers compared to the other. Um, there's still research coming out on the shift between muscle fiber types um, from a molecular standpoint, what's happening to those proteins. Um, most people who are genetically more predisposed to type one are probably more successful at type one activities and will continue to train to develop their intermediate fibers into more type one or slower twitch fibers. Those who are probably more genetically predisposed to type two fibers and then train with more um, explosive strength, power, speed activities will develop those intermediate fibers into further type two fibers. All right, so let's review, bring it all together. If we create tension, contract, shorten, okay, or if we resist, or if we have no tension, which is each. Concentric is where we shorten the length and we create motion, resist lengthening, that's our eccentric action. Um, creating tension without movement, isometric action. Okay, so concentric, shortening, more force than the outside force. So positive, concentric is positive. Eccentric is negative, or it's a resisting, we're lengthening the muscle, the action is going in the opposite direction of our force. Okay, isometric, the muscles try to shorten, create tension, but do not cause any movement. So we maintain the position of that joint. Okay, if we think about it from our torque perspective, a concentric muscle actions, our internal force or internal torque and the motion are in the same direction. So my flexor torque causes flexion or my extensor torque causes extension. Eccentric action, my flexor torque resists extension or my extensor torque resists flexion. And then isometric, we balance out those forces. So there's an external flexion torque and my internal extension torque balance them out. So they're opposing forces that are equal and opposite to maintain position with tension. All right, thank you very much.